through a couple of minutes of interesting facts that you need to know as you're launching products and services into the market. And I just want to give you a different perspective of what we think about different things um, and different trends that are happening in the market. And the journey I'll take you through today is the minds of the consumers. And at any stage, we're involved in pushing our consumers or our customers to make certain decisions. And these decisions are factored around a couple of things. Are factored around pushing them to purchase your product over other people's products, picking up your service as compared to the services of other people, or changing a particular behavior. And a lot of these behavior change differ, uh, differs in terms of the approach that you take. And therefore, when we are trying to change behavior, there's something that we need to keep at the back of our minds. It's called the dual thinking approach. And I'll introduce you to what the dual thinking approach is and, and how it has implications. A couple of us, um, after interacting with uh, social researchers, you had us mention about system one and system two. If not interacted with them, I'll take you through what system one and system two mean and the implication that that has on uh, the different decisions that we make. Now, scientists believe that a lot of our consumers have a dual thinking approach. And what does this dual thinking approach mean? That most of the time, we use one part of our brain, which is referred to as system one. And this one switches in automatically. It's the part of the brain that, um, that we use 95% of the time. And therefore, this is the part of the brain that we need to activate most of the time in either our products positioning or in our communications positioning. But um, I'll take you through the process. Then there's the other part of the brain. And the second part of the brain is what is referred to as system two. Now, system two only gets used in 5% of the instances. And when it gets used in 5% of the instances, it only gets switched on when you face a barrier or when you're facing a difficult decision. And let me give you an example of a moment when we use system two, exams. <laughs> okay? So that is one particular moment where we have to think much in detail and make it in system one and system two. And you wonder, Hilda, why are you setting us with a lot of um, information about system one and system two? And it's because it has a lot of influence in terms of the decisions that uh, we make or the decisions that our customers make. And therefore, when we are positioning our products and our services, we need to be aware that we do not want to get it so complicated because people mainly use that one system one, which has no control and which one uses most of the time. However, system one has its own weaknesses. And these weaknesses are affected by context. And I will show you how system one gets affected by context. Now I want a volunteer. What's the missing letter? Someone from that table? You. You. Why did you think you? There's a table. There's a setting. Like a restaurant? Okay. Now let's switch gears. What's the missing letter? Why? It's a bathroom. Do you see how we shift according to context? Mm. And that's the same way our consumers shift according to the context. So it becomes you when we see a restaurant. It becomes an A when we see a bathroom. Okay? Now what is in operation here? System one. It's fast. It's automatic. Okay? It's what we have no control over, which comes in 95% um, of the time. However, system one has its own weaknesses. And the weaknesses that it has is that sometimes we have to make a lot of decisions. On any one day we make thousands of decisions, right? Let's start with the ladies. What shall I wear today? Does this look good? Is it so cold? Is it going to keep me warm? Okay. We make quite a number of decisions on any one particular day. And therefore, when we're making these decisions, we have limited time. And when we have limited time, what happens? We shape ourselves from the context and the experiences that we've had with similar situations in the past. We also have limited memory. We don't remember everything, okay? Mm -hmm. And we have limited exposure, okay? So therefore, we make decisions according to the level of exposure that we have. However, 
What the implication of this is that we tend to make satisfactory decisions as compared to rational decisions. Okay? Now what happens is that when I am on a shelf and I'm picking a particular product, there are quite a number of things that I look at based on my context. And therefore, at the end of the day, as a customer, I pick that particular product or I pick that particular service according to my context. You understand? Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is very important for us to understand the context in which our customers are operating in because that context shapes them to make satisfactory decisions. And these satisfactory decisions end up becoming very irrational decisions that you see what someone else has done and it does not make sense to you. But why doesn't it make sense to you? because it is not rational according to your measures or according to your context. Now, two groups of people know about system one and therefore they capitalize on it. And these two groups of people are politicians. When they don't want to sway public agenda to a particular one, they capitalize on our system, system one. They tell us this is not good. Or if we do this, we are going to do this. Eh? They read constitutions on our behalf. Okay? That's capitalizing on system one, okay? Um, the other group that makes use of system one is marketers and advertisers. And it's because we are juggling the responsibility of selling our products, of selling our services, or changing particular behavior in a particular way. And therefore, what do we do? To captivate system one, we adopt pricing strategies, yeah? So what do we do? We place it as 999, instead of? A thousand. A thousand. Why? Because we are trying to capitalize on loss aversion. People hate losing. And therefore they will try and maximize what they want. Okay? What else do we do? We brand things colorfully and we advertise beautifully. Okay? What else do we do? We frame. Huh? Yeah. So we position yogurt as 20% fat free. So what about the 80%? <laughs> so we adopt a lot of framing strategies. We also, especially those in the social space, we also adopt a lot of social influence and shaming to a way that, that we can do different things, that be part of the pack, be part of the group. However, we tend to use a lot of prediction and we tend to make the use of the assumption that if something has worked in the past, that it will work continuously in the future. And I'm about to show you that it gets difficult from here. And the reason why it gets difficult from here is that Ipsos, we have identified a couple of trends of things that may change in the market, or things that are already happening in some markets that are going to revolutionize how we think about our consumers and how we shape the different contexts in which they operate. So the first one I'll take you through is the population shift. And I'll show you what's happening in the, in the, in the global world and how that will have an impact on our businesses. I'll take you through about uh, the growth of the mega cities. Healthier and sicker. I know it's a paradox. How can someone be healthier and at the same time sicker? But I'll show you. Um, I'll show you the impact of connected, uh, connectedness and the issues about privacy, the rise of individual choice, and then cultural convergence. So I'll take you through the first one population shifts. And we have no parts in front of us, and I want us to do an experiment here. Okay? We're ready? <coughs> Let's do this. I want you on one corner to write for me how many children your grandparents had. And you can pick it aside. Okay. Either your maternal side or you're expecting a very difficult experience. Let's do this. Okay? So write for me the total number of your two children. Your grandparents had. Okay, we've done that. I want you to write the number of children your parents had. You've written? Okay, then I also want you to write the number of children you have or you're intending to have. <laughs> what do you notice? Are the number of children increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. They're decreasing, yeah? So when we're talking about and we're seeing statistics saying that the population of the world will become big and the planet will not be able to handle. 
At Ipsos, we are questioning some of those statistics. You have evidence in front of you. But I have more statistics to disapprove whether the population is going to actually increase or decrease. Now, I want you to look at those charts. And sorry, um, some font might not be visible to you. And I want you to notice two lines in each particular chart. I want you to notice the red line. You notice the red line? Mm -hmm. And I also want you to notice the blue line. Do you notice it? Yeah. The blue line is children aged 0 to 14 years. All the way up to the year 2100. The red line is the population of the world aged between 15 to 64. What do you notice? Do you notice what I'm noticing? That the population of the world is growing older yeah. and older, and we do not have new, new many new parts. Yes. Okay, what's the implication for us as marketers? It means that we're going to shift our target market from the young generation that we're talking about into more mature generations. And this trend is visible across the world. It's evident across the world and has already happened in quite a number of countries across the world. The population is declining. And while the population is declining in some of these parts of the world, what is happening is that people are becoming older and older. And therefore, the, cons the spending power will tend to be with those who are older and older. Okay? But that's not it about the, um, uh, the population. There's another trend that we will observe when you look at this uh, UN statistics. Now, the growth of mega cities. We've been seeing our politicians talking about how they're going to build mega cities. Eh? And we're thinking, ah, they want to just take our money and go. But I want you to notice something. More and more people are going to move into urban areas. And the data is evident. When you look at trends from the last uh, couple of years, 2000, you can see in a number of countries, we didn't have anything more than 55% living in urban areas. But I want you to look at the yellow bar, which is a reflection of the South, South African countries. About 77% by 2050 will be living in urban areas. Okay? We tend to be saying that the backbone of our economy is what? Agriculture. Which is based on rural areas. But that, that changes with time. Now, I also want to use you to see a couple of statistics. I want you to see Nigeria. In the year 2000, about 35% of Nigerians were living in urban areas. By 2050, it is projected that 70% of Nigerians will be living in urban areas. Look at South Africa. 57% compared to about 80% by 2050. Look at what on Somalia. 33% to 64%. And what's the implication of this? As people move to the urban areas, what happens? They're exposed to more education yeah. opportunities, right? Yeah. When they're exposed to more education opportunities, then they're also exposed to a lot of employment activities. When they're exposed to a lot of employment activities with a fewer population, with a declining population, it means that they're able to negotiate for higher pay. When they're able to negotiate for higher pay, what happens? We tend to have more meet people in the middle income category. We have more people with the spending power. So we'll be trying to market our products to who? The middle income categories. Fine, they'll be a part of the population living below a dollar a day, and we'll show you the implication of that. But then, as it happens to most of these countries, when we're talking about mega cities, we tend to think about great sea and glamorous type of cities. But looking at how our leaders plan for our cities, what happens? They don't plan very well. So we're going to have a lot of congestion, a lot of chaos, and a lot of pollution. Mm. So what is this going to do to us? It's going to make us sicker. Mm. Okay? Mm. We're also going to have an increased need of food. With 70% to 80% of the population living in urban areas, what do you think will happen? More, more need for, for food. And therefore, we might see some need of mechanization in agriculture. But beyond the population decline and bulging of the population in some categories, and people moving to uh, mega cities, there's another trend I want to show you. And this is the rise of individual choice. And this is where you need to pay attention, especially because it hurts you. 
Now, what is going to happen is that with the increase of urbanization, <coughs> then you're going to see smaller families. If you notice the types of families you tend to see in urban areas are smaller as compared to those in rural areas. With smaller families, what happens? You also tend to see fewer marriages, okay? With fewer marriages, what will happen? We'll have a lot of single person households. So when you're doing a lot of your advertisement showing people having breakfast as a family, <laughs> that, 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 that will not have much implication in terms of your advertising in the future, in the future world, okay? Now it's going to raise pressure for individual success. It's solitary living. It's me, myself, and I. Okay? Then what is going to happen? When you have people pushing for individual success, then it's going to need a lot of personalization of products and services. It is not a one-size-fits-all situation in product design, in service design. It's not going to be that anymore. And therefore, we're, tending, we're going to see a rise of local brands or a rise of global brands. And this has already started to happen. Now, I want you to look at those brands that I have there. Were they in existence, some of them, 20 years ago? Were they even big brands 20 years ago? Were they big brands now? Why? It is just because they provided consumers with an interface to personalize experience. That's it. They just provided an interface to personalize experience. And that is where the market is going um, in the future. Now I gave you the paradox of healthier and sicker. Why do I say healthier and sicker? With urban living, you're exposed to lesser risk, okay? Uh, according to the traditional view. And therefore, it's causing a rise in life expectancy. So people are living longer than they used to live before. However, they're going to be living in mega cities where there's a lot of pollution. They're also going to be living in mega cities where there's not much exercise. So you're going to see a lot of rise in obesity. Okay? And the question we wonder is we're moving away from lifestyle, we're moving towards lifestyle diseases. And are our healthcare systems ready for this? And we're likely to see healthcare moving from curative to preventive making people stay healthier and longer. And that's the paradox of healthier and sicker. Then there's the issue of connectedness. And when we're talking about connectedness, we're just talking about the internet and the things that it has done for us. But the internet and the things that it has done for us has implications into how we position our products and services for the future. Now what is happening is that more and more people are only what? The smartphone. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're able to make quite a number of choices. Now, when they own the smartphone and they're living in mega cities, more single person households, more individual choice, what's happening? It's creating a rise in individualism, okay? And you can already see the individualism. What do we do when we have family gatherings? Yeah? <laughs> we're on the phone, okay? When we go for dinner, where are we? We're on the phone, okay? It's going to create a lot of individualism. Now, with the individualism, what you'll end up saying is that people are accessing multiple channels. And when people are accessing multiple channels, it means that their data is on Facebook, it's on Instagram, it's on WhatsApp, it's on Twitter, you know what's next. Okay? There's a lot of duplication of data. So when we're talking about big data, how complete is that data in one particular channel? It's not. Okay? Then there's the issue of data privacy. How private is our data when we have multiple channels split and knowing our data privacy laws that we have in, in the different countries. But more and more what we see is giving rise to online or, or, uh, economies. In some countries, you'll see a lot of economies running on Facebook. In other economies, you'll see proper online economies. And you saw recently what Safaricom did. It's enabled you to make payments to AliExpress, okay? So you can import things from any other part of the world and bring them into, into Kenya. But what's the implication of this? Delivery systems. Mm -hmm. So it's going to come through your poster. Is poster Kenya ready? <laughs> Is it ready? We're going to have issues about payment systems across borders. Are payment systems ready and interchangeable? Mm -hmm. We're also going to have issues with dispute resolution. 
because we're talking about different laws in different countries. What law applies where and how are we going to resolve the disputes across different boundaries? But more and more, with dwindling population and with need for labor, we're going to see a lot of in, uh, a lot of application of artificial intelligence and a lot of mechanization, especially in the agriculture. But more important, and this will equally affect us all, is cultural convergence. And I want us to do a quick experiment. How many languages do we have in Kenya? 40 something, okay? 40 something plus, okay? How many of our children can speak those local languages? Very few. <laughs> What's the implication of this? They are on online platforms, aren't they? Yeah. If they are on online platforms, what's the language of this platform? English. English. They want to become the English world. Mm. Or the Kiswahili world. One language. What does this one language mean for us? It's going to create an ink a bit of one tribe. And this one tribe is going to be cultured around issues. It's either one tribe around issues, the rich versus the, the poor. It's also going to be based on different other things, language. When we have one language, one tribe, what happens? People tend to focus on the same issues. Okay? When people tend to focus on the same issues, we are likely to see some of the traditionally taboo topics being discussed. You know, there are some taboo topics in Kenya that our president won't touch, okay? Mm -hmm. We are likely to see agitation and push for some discussion about them. But more and more, it's going to create some sort of nostalgia about the, the past. When this creates uh, nostalgia about the past, what does, does it also do? It is going to create a rising populism. People agitating for the same issues, for a better world, for a safer planet, for better interest rates, for better products and services, for better internet connection. They're going to agitate for the same issue. And companies are going to feel pressure <coughs> from the rising populism. But then the rising populism is going to create pressure for companies. And what is going to happen is that more companies are going to be forced to show their good corporate governance. How we are treating our staff, right? How we are giving back to the community how we are pricing products appropriately, how we are using safe products, how we are using proper labor. It's also going to create a push for labor. And that, my friends, is the changing context. You've seen the population increase, and how the population increase is going to rise, cause a rise in the growth of mega cities. The rise of mega cities is going to create a rise of individual choice. Individual choice is going to create an increase in people becoming either healthier or Seeker. We're also going to see a lot of cultural convergence and increased connectivity. But what's the implication of all of this on all of us? Now, with the changing context, and knowing that our customers are mainly making satisfactory decisions as compared to rational decisions, what do we do? The implication for us is that we cannot use historical data, we cannot use past trends to define products and services. We need to understand consumers continuously for us to keep up with the global world that is changing. Thank you.